uh, speculated about the death of capitalism. I'm going to talk about death in capitalism. <laughs> and Koss has talked about recovering, being a recovering economist. I am an economist who is not being allowed to recover. <laughs> there I am standing by the shore of a swiftly flowing river, and I hear the cry of a drowning man. So I jump into the river, put my arms around him, pull him to shore, and apply artificial respiration. Just as he begins to breathe, another cry for help. Back in the river again, reaching, pulling, applying, breathing, and then another yell. Again and again, without end, goes the sequence. You know, I'm so busy jumping in, pulling them to shore, applying artificial respiration. I have no time to see who the hell is upstream pushing them all in. Or <laughs> from a doctor. And what this book is about, at least in part about anyway, is uh, where did infectious disease, which dominated the 19th century in capitalism, come from? Where did they go? And why have chronic diseases replaced them? And our argument in the book, and Ian isn't here um, to defend himself, um, the argument in the book is these are social and economic realities, not naturally resistible uh, laws, genes, germs, but they're social conditions that determine these outcomes. And so we're arguing in the book that the context for infectious disease in the U.S. is being overworked, underpaid, overcrowded, in unsanitary conditions. And wages too low to afford the quantity and quality of food necessary to uh, maintain the human immune system. And that's the critical issue with respect to infectious diseases. So mainstream economists have something called the marginal productivity theory of distribution, which means you get paid in according to your productivity. Well, that is another one of the forces. And even Stiglitz these days has basically argued this was one of the favorite theories of the rich to try to justify inequality. And while productivity grows among workers, the amount of wages they receive is much more determined by class struggle than is determined by some automatic process. And so our argument is going to be that unions, more than any other institution, and we're talking about the United States, but we could we spread the analysis to other countries, are responsible for the decline in the infectious disease mortality rates of the 19th century. Because unions are the ones who fought for higher wages, child labor laws, the 12, the eight, 12 10, 8 hour day, and because of that, they began to gain some of the um, economic rewards of having increased productivity so dramatically. And so it is a union-based model for determining the trends, what public health people call the epidemiological transition from infectious to chronic disease. And so, um, how did, um, what were the conditions? Well, we know about wages, and we know how low they were, even though their productivity was growing. And the book is, as Alan suggested, an attempt both to have a robust theory and systematic evidence, along with some case studies or stories that go along with it to make the book sort of readable and coherent along the way. So wages uh, are too low to sustain the health of the family despite a work week that can only be described as crushing. So you're being paid too low to be able to work eight hours a day and sustain your family. According to a report published in 1893, the average work in manufacturing in 1850 was 69 hours a week. By 1890, the work week still stood at 60 hours. And so you're working below subsistence wages, and you're working 60-hour work weeks at the same time. All of this, of course, we're arguing has a huge impact on what we refer to as the epidemic constitution, the human immune system. Um, it's well known, not in mainstream medicine, like mainstream economics, it is well known in the School of Public Health that mainstream medicine was simply chronologically too late to have been responsible for the decline of typhoid, cholera, and all the rest of the infectious disease. How do we know this? Because the antibiotics, the immunizations, all came after the dramatic decline in the death from infectious disease of all these, of all these diseases. And a more even uh, important, possibly important idea is that something like 40% of the world at the present period has the tubercular bacilli in their gut at this moment. And so the argument here is that germs only have their pathogenic effect most germs anyway, under certain social economic conditions. And once you have got 2,000 calories a day, McEwen is the most famous epidemiologist at all. He's the one who basically told us that mainstream medicine has had little to do with the decline in mortality. He argued 2,000 calories a day. There's debate, others would argue. There's other factors such as the eight hour day and child labor laws. And so, but the, the general consensus from schools of public health is that it's those working and living conditions that make the difference. Now the question is, how do, we, how do those working living conditions change? Is there some sort of automatic process? 
of wages uh, growing because people's productivity. And our answer here, once again, in a very short version, between 1881 and 1890, the Bureau of Labor Statistics registered 9,668 strikes or lockouts. By comparison, the United States present period, between 66 and 74, the number of work stoppages involving 1,000 workers or more never fell below 250. So 1,000 a year versus 250. The average was 352 with a peak in 74, this historical reference. Work stoppages then began to fall off rapidly, reaching a low point of 14 in 2003. If you want to know why in the current United States, it's a bit derivative here, why, pro why profits have gone like this and wages have gone like this, it's the defeat of the union movement. It's the fact that there are no strikes. But these strikes in the 19th century, there weren't simply so many of them, they were often violent, they were very aggressive. There were sh uh, shots fired on both sides. Um, the Homestead strike, Andrew Carnegie is one uh, famous example. In response to a strike by the workers, he locked them out. Uh, Henry Frick, his chief uh, um, operator, uh, the workers then occupied the factory. Five days later, 300 men of the famous Union Busting Pinkerton Agency attempted to retake the mill in a vicious fight that left Pinkertons dead and workers dead. It failed, the workers maintained control over the factory, and so what happened after that? The National Guard was sent in and 8,500 troops were sent in to get the workers out. Homestead is just one example of many, many strikes like this. In fact, we hypothesize, after reading this history carefully and looking at the number of strikes, the level of violence, that uh, both employers and workers, well, the message was clear. In the event of industrial conflict, firms could count on the military force of the state to break strikes where we're looking for child labor laws, a 10-hour day, and wages which were a small fraction of the increase in productivity of those workers. In fact, you could probably make a better case that the state economic policy in support of private sector profits caused epidemic disease than you could caused by germs or anything else. As soon as those wages grew, those diseases began to dissipate. Workers were not pacifists. That's the other sort of side of the story. In 1877, the Pennsylvania Railroad buildings in Pittsburgh were burned down. In 1910, California, uh, workers in California blew up the Los Angeles Times building because the, the company was one of the leaders of the open shop movement to the state. Gunplay and fatalities were standard features of protest. What was also common was result of these violent conflicts most frequently went against the workers. And so these unions were defeated over and over again, often shot, executed in some cases for crimes against capital, demanding higher wages, etc. Uh, in spite of the decimation of unions in the late 1800s, they grew rapidly in the first part of the 20th century, and so we have numbers here on how rapidly the unions grow, how many more union members uh, were formed. These unions then began to turn political. Seventy-three municipalities had socialist mayors. Eugene V. Debs, Eugene v. Debs began to win uh, more and more votes as a socialist uh, uh, candidate. So what happened? Capital, fearing uh, violence, Union movements out of control, the Democratic Party began to reform itself and take on the most conservative of labor's demands. And so we have the beginning of the 12-hour day, the 10-hour day, the 8-hour day. We have the corporations accepting rising wages. One of the reasons people say that Ford introduced the $5 day in order to sell cars, I don't think there's any, um, any Ford couldn't care less about whether, if his workers could afford cars, he wasn't exploiting them enough. The reason Ford introduced the five-hour day is to reduce the number of strikes because he was making so much profits that the strikes were costing him so much money and if he paid five dollars a day he could actually get his workers to work more productively. Just one sort of quick example of the history which we don't agree with. So modern illness, where did modern illness come from? Very briefly, faced with rising wages, a shorter working day, capital turned to mechanizing and chemicalizing production. In order to lower its cost of production because wages are growing and there's a shorter working day and there's fewer workers in the reserve army of the unemployed, 75,000 new chemicals have been introduced into the environment that human beings have never been exposed to for in human history. And our argument there is those 75,000 chemicals, the transformation of our food, high cholesterol, high fat, chemicals in the food, those chemicals are the basis for the dramatic growth in heart disease and cancer. Most people think these are diseases of old age, and there's a tendency to get them, there's a long gestation period, but people who lived to 70 and 75 years old, and there were many of them in the 19th century, didn't get heart disease and cancer. They died of infectious diseases. 
And of course, we now have children getting this, the number two killer of children in the United States is cancer after accidents. And so while age has something to do with it, it's much more, we argue, with the qualitative transformation of our environment. I don't know how much more time I have here, Alan, but... Um, okay, uh, in Bill Bryson's, here's a, one of our entertaining stories in the midst of this. In Bill Bryson's Entertaining Guide to the Sciences, a short history of nearly everything, one of his scientific heroes was Iowa, Iowa farm boy Claire Patterson. Patterson is spearheaded the battle against the use of lead. Bryson's villain in the lead story was Thomas Midgley, who pioneered the use of lead and gasoline to reduce engine knock while working for General Motors. Realizing the valuable substance, when he saw one, GM banded together with DuPont and Standard Oil to form the Ethyl Corporation, which you probably have all heard of, with the goal of getting as much lead into products as we could possibly buy. Lead was sprayed on fruit, used in food tins, appeared in toothpaste. As we now know it, lead is a neurotoxin. And then we talk about the, the rest of the story about how they fought to this day over lead being a neural tax and getting out of gasoline and everything else because, of course, they make a profit. That's a case story of thousands and thousands of other chemicals that have been introduced into our environment. We then talk about the difference between a biomedical approach, a lifestyle approach, or a political economy approach. And the lifestyle approach, of course, is you're responsible for eating too much, for drinking too much, and smoking too much cigarettes. You have choices and you're making bad ones. You're responsible for your own early death, premature death. The biomedical approach says, well, if you get cancer, what we're going to do is we're going to find a biochemical, we're going to find a chemical agent chemotherapy to deal with it. Well, the political economy approach looks at Andrea Martin, who had her blood tested. She later on died of cancer. And what did she find when she had her blood tested? Well, she had 90 chemicals in her blood that she never, by choice, <coughs> to your point about you know, neoclassical economists and people make choices, none of which she knew she had in her system, 52 of which were carcinogenic. And she did not work in a chemical factory. She had an ordinary life in California, and so by living an ordinary life in California, by no choice for all, the political economy of the corporate world basically gave her cancer, which she then died from. Um, once again, we talk about to what extent mainstream medicine is effective with respect to heart disease and cancer, the argument. It isn't, and at the end, policy. Uh, policy options. One of the things you're told is if we get rid of these chemicals, we're going to be back in the Stone Age. We have to deindustrialize. Well, the European Union has formed something called Regulation, Evaluation, and Authorization of Chemicals. It's called REACH. And they've done risk assessment, and they've done cost-benefit analysis, and they've decided that they, they, they are going to remove 1,400 chemicals, which are known mutagens and carcinogens. And the calculation that the chemical industry said this is going to cost the economy $2.5 billion in Europe. The European Union's economists, there are some, and other scientists, have come to the conclusion by eliminating these 12 to 1400 chemicals, the European Union will save $60 billion in uh, premature death, um, cost of health care, and a whole range of other things. And so when they say efficiency, when they say the economy works in a particular way, and there's no alternative, always beware of that, because it's never true, just like on the financial crisis, never mind um, in Greece and, and health care crisis. And then, of course, we know that the, the uh, Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, these countries are the high-tax, high-spend countries with the biggest bureaucracies, and these are the countries with half the pollution, better health outcomes, partly because of the pollution, and also partly because of equity. And so it's the high-tax, high-spend countries that are also competitive economically in the world with all these sort of low-tax, and of course we know, if we look at, if we look at Europe and we look at the so-called pigs, these are countries who have spent less than the average of the rest of the European Union on welfare, welfare in general, while they're being told to cut their welfare expenditures. And it's the Germans and the French, for, for a number of reasons which I can't get into now, are the ones that are doing all the spending on health, education, and welfare. And yet the German and French banks are the ones being paid back. Um, I'm sure I'm running out of time here. And so the book has everything you could possibly want to know. <laughs> Not only about this topic, but about Obamacare, which is another part of the book, and the US healthcare system, which I talked about earlier. The World Health Organization uh, argues that the solution to premature death, high infant mortality rates, uh, short and longevity is corrosive are the corrosive effects of inequality of life chances requires addressing the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources. And those of you who are Star Trek fans, 
Resistance is not futile, but it exists already in some countries, and it is absolutely necessary. Thank you. What's interesting is, I mean, if you are recovering on the promise, I, I, I'm suffering from terminal economics. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say terminal? Terminal. Terminal economics. Chronic terminal economics. I, I need to go to rehab. <laughs>